civil war. President Abraham Lincoln, perplexed at how to reunite the country, thought about the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, despite widespread misconception, the Emancipation Proclamation, the document did not end slavery in our country, but it did lay the foundation for it. A professor explains what prompted Lincoln to draft the Emancipation Proclamation, what that document did, and what motivated the president to take the final step to end slavery once and for all, in the United States. Before the Emancipation Proclamation, President Abraham Lincoln had other ideas of how to end the enslavement of Africans and their descendants in America. At one point, he talked about uh, sending freed Africans back to uh, Liberia or perhaps to Central America and compensating the slave owners. But that did not work out, but that did not work out well because some black people he talked to were opposed to that idea. Damon L. Fordham is an author and history professor at the Citadel. He says Lincoln was going to be up for re-election and found himself playing a delicate game of politics with very high stakes. The essence of the Emancipation Proclamation was Lincoln himself was opposed to slavery, but knew that if he openly came out against it, he would lose the vote even in the North after the South seceded. That just simply was not a popular issue. So he finally figured out that if he was started winning some victories in the Civil War on the Union side, that would give a mandate for him to go with emancipation. So after the Battle of Etiatum, he uh, decided to come up with the Emancipation Proclamation that went into effect that January the 1st, 1863. According to the Library of Congress, Lincoln issued the preliminary proclamation in September 1862 and signed the final document, New Year's Day, 1863. It contained very specific language as to which states would be forced to end slavery. In some cases, states were even split by region and counties as to which enslaved people would be freed and which ones wouldn't. It would not affect people in Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, or uh, Missouri, because those were states below the Mason-Dixon lines that were not rebelling against the United States. And it would affect those other lower Confederate states who were in rebellion, with the exception of part of Virginia, who would later become West Virginia, as well as counties in Louisiana that were not rebelling. Tennessee was not affected by the document either. The National Park Service website tells us that although it had seceded, Tennessee was under Union control at the time. So all the states and areas you see here in the lighter shade were not mentioned in the Emancipation Proclamation and would be allowed to continue slavery. As for the states that would have to end slavery per the Emancipation Proclamation, they were Arkansas, Texas, the rebelling portion of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and the rebelling portion of Virginia. Another component of the document allowed those who had previously been enslaved to enlist in the Union Army in the fight for freedom. And as word got out, black people started running away from plantations throughout the southern United States and joining the Union Army, and that had the desired effect of crippling the Confederate war effort. Oftentimes, Union soldiers would read the Emancipation Proclamation to enslaved persons in occupied areas. And so even in the areas where it was not supposed to go in effect, black people took it upon themselves to leave the plantations and bring their families and join the Union Army so that they could be free. Fordham says the Union Army would need all the help it could get to defeat the Confederacy because not everyone in the North supported the effort. You had a lot of, peop a lot of people saying, well, if the South wanted to secede, that's their business. And Lincoln had difficulty in recruiting white men to join in the Union Army effort, you see. It was such that people could pay $300 for a substitute to fight for them if they were wealthy. So a lot of uh, white northerners felt it was a rich man's war and the poor man's fight. 
Some in the South felt the same way and didn't want to shed their blood for a cause they didn't believe in. That's why the component of the document allowing former enslaved people to join the Union Army was crucial to ending the war. In the Emancipation Proclamation, he said that all persons held as slaves in those areas were then, thenceforward, and forever free, and that all men of suitable condition would be able to join the Union Army. And that was, of course, necessary because Lincoln understood that if black people were to fight against the Confederacy, who was, ho was holding their people in slavery, that they would have a greater reason to fight with greater vigor. And as the tide continued to turn in favor of the North, former slave and abolitionist Frederick Douglass encouraged President Lincoln, who had won a second term, to eradicate slavery. And so after he won the 1864 election, he began to take it a step further and, pass for the thir and press for the 13th Amendment to the Constitution that would end slavery, period, within the United States. Both houses of Congress had passed the 13th Amendment by January 1865. Lincoln would be assassinated in April of that year. Fordham has a personal connection to the Emancipation Proclamation. His great-grandfather, James Buchanan Maxwell, witnessed the end of slavery and was one of the first generations to benefit from it. He was present when they read the Emancipation Proclamation, and he went on to become a notary public during Reconstruction, a graduate of the Avery Institute, and went to court over his right to vote in 1879. For almost 160 years now, the city of Charleston has celebrated the significance of the Emancipation Proclamation with a parade on New Year's Day. Charleston city officials say it is the oldest parade in the nation commemorating the Emancipation Proclamation. As of 2023, the parade route now ends at the International African American Museum, located at Gadsden's Wharf, where as many as 40 percent of all enslaved persons brought to America disembarked from slave ships.